Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you at Scalacon and uh, to be able to show you my presentation. It quacks, but it's not a duck. Structural typing in Scala 3. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Michał Pauka. I work at uh, Virtus Lab uh, and I'm a part of uh, the Scala 3 compiler team. Uh, I've been working there for uh, seven years in the company and uh, two years in the compiler team. Uh, you can find me uh, on, on GitHub and uh, on Twitter. And going back to the topic of my presentation, probably you know the saying that if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a, hmm, not necessarily a duck. For example, um, in Australia, there is uh, an endemic species of uh, a frog uh, called the quacking frog, which actually makes a sound like a duck's quack. Also, it can walk, it can swim. So why don't we call it a duck either? Mm. We can ask this kind of philosophical question to be or not to be, but actually now we're not talking about the sense of existence, but actually what it means to be something especially in programming. In Scala, uh, we can compare values either by their identity, as you can see uh, in the uh, upper part of the screen, when we have a normal class with some fields and we create two instances of this class which are identical but actually they're not the same object so they are not equal however if we define a case class then instances of this case class are compared uh, by the values that are parts of this class so two instances of the same class can be equal, even though they're not the same instance of an object. Similarly, we can think of comparing types. Uh, if we have two classes, then the compiler will say that they're not the same class but they have some structure which is actually the same. Uh, and we can see that both foo and bar are a subtype of some type with these two uh, fields. And uh, also when we think of the structure of a type, Normally, the ordering of uh, fields is not important. Uh, we can also um, alias types. Uh, and when we compare a type and an alias, it, mm, the compiler might say that they're the same type because uh, these are just type aliases, but we can also define opaque types, uh, which make types uh, really different. Um, so we tried comparing values, we tried comparing types, but this relation of being can be also applied to um, values uh, in context of types. So if we instantiate a class, then we can say an instance of this class is of this type. So uh, here are all valid duck, 
is indeed a duck, and transitively, uh, transitively uh, it's uh, also an animal because each duck is an animal. Uh, we can think of uh, typing systems in program languages at least in two uh, axes. So typing systems can be either uh, nominal or structural. So uh, in nominal typing, we um, pay attention at the identity of types. Uh, so, even if two types have identical structures, they're not the same type. Mm. Uh, and uh, we can also um, think of uh, types as uh, checked at runtime or at compile time. So, whether it's dynamic typing or static typing, and these concepts are quite a, um, orthogonal to each other. Um, probably you might have heard uh, the term duck typing, which uh, most commonly refers to a mixture of structural and dynamic typing. If we try to give some examples of uh, these typing systems, uh, Scala would probably be described as a statically um, a static nominal uh, type system. Uh, although this is not like a, always so clear. Um, and we might try to ask, can we achieve similar behavior that we have in other types of uh, typing systems in Scala. Uh, so let's look at an example. We have three classes and ducks and uh, quacking frogs can quack, but uh, cats obviously can't. Um, then in uh, in static, nominal static typing, mm, we look at the types that are given at compile time. So we say that something is a duck only if it's declared to be a duck and it's known at compile time. If we do any casts, we lose this information. Uh, and if we try to check if something is a duck, Mm, based on the fact that it walks, but it's not declared as a duck, then it's not a duck. Uh, in dynamic nominal typing, we also look at the declared type, but we look actually at the runtime type uh, of in instances. So even if we cast something to a more general type, mm, uh, then it still is a duck. Um, we can also um, compare types uh, in a static structural way. So you can see that uh, a quacking frog would be now a duck just because it quacks and it's known at compile time. And the last option is that we check everything at runtime. Here we check if a method exists using reflection. So only a cat would not be claimed to be a duck here. OK, so uh, can we um, now get something between static and dynamic typing in Scala? Well, uh, we have uh, the Scala dynamic trait, which is a marker trait that we can extend to show um, the compiler that something is supposed to be dynamic. Mm. 
the usage of this marker trait will cause some syntactic rewrites during compilation, but they uh, these rewrites are applied only if we try to refer to a member of a type that uh, is not known at compile time to exist. So it's not declared in this class or it's not inherited or it's not introduced by an extension method uh, or an implicit conversion. Uh, dynamics work both in Scala 2 and 3 and need to be explicitly enabled either by a language import or by a compiler flag. Um, the dynamic trait can define up to four methods, um, which, which we will look at more closely now. The first one uh, is select dynamic. So let's say we have some class, we instantiate it and we try to refer to a field defined inside of it. Obviously this is going to compile and the type of it is going to be string. But if we try to refer to something that is not defined in this type, normally that would cause a compilation error. But if we extend this dynamic trait, the compiler will first try to rewrite these um, selections, din.bar or din.cooks, into din.selectDynamic and uh, passing the name of this uh, selection member as a string. So to make this work, we need to implement uh, the select dynamic method in din class. And the point is that this type signature actually could look like this or it could be different, but the point is that it needs to compile after this uh, syntactic rewrite. So a select dynamic takes a string and returns something that we actually don't know what that might be. We just declare it to return any and it's going to compile and in the first case is going to return a value, but in the second uh, case, it uh, um, causes uh, an exception because this key is not defined in our map. Uh, the second method is update dynamic. So let's say we have another class and it has uh, a variable inside of it, we instantiate it, and we try to set this var variable. So you might know that, or you might not be aware of that, but normally such a thing is distributed by the compiler to a call to a, a setter method, but this still has nothing to do with dynamics yet. Now, if we try to set a value or a variable that is not a member of DIN, then, uh, of course, the compiler will complain. Uh, but if we extend uh, this dynamic trait, the compiler will try to rewrite this to din.updateDynamic of bar, which is the name of the selection, and the value that we try to assign to this variable. So once again, to make this compile, we need to implement this method. And inside of it, we just set the value at the key in our mutable map. The next uh, method is apply dynamic. Once again, we have a class and it extends the dynamic trait now. So when we try to call a method that doesn't exist in this class, 
as you might expect, similarly, the compiler will try to rewrite it. So as the first parameter, again, we get the name of this uh, member that we try to uh, call. And all the remaining parameters are passed in a, a current parameters list. So if we implement this apply dynamic method like this, this is going to compile. As we take the name as the parameter and a barracks list of arguments so that it can match different signatures at call site. We can accept one parameter or more uh, or zero and they can as they can have different types, we just treat them as any. And this is going to work. As you can see, we just prefix this, these uh, parameters with the string constant at the beginning of each tuple. And uh, the last method of uh, uh, of uh, a dynamic trait is uh, apply dynamic named. So um, actually, we don't. There is no restriction of uh, on extending. Uh, this dynamic trait only in classes we can extend an object to and we can call it whatever we want. And this call to tag.foo with some named parameters will be rewritten by the compiler to apply dynamic named of this name of selection. And then in the list of parameters, uh, we get everything in this exact order we used for the call. Uh, and But uh, every parameter uh, is prefixed with the name of this parameter we have here. So to make this compile, we define apply dynamic named method taking some name and some arguments. Uh, once again, there is no strict uh, like rule how this signature of apply dynamic named should look uh, as long as it matches the signature that appears here after the rewrite. So we take um, in this case, a barracks list of tuples of string and anything. And in this example, we just try to create a XML tag with some name and some attributes. And as you can see, that's what we would get here. Uh, okay, so now things might get uh, more complicated if you wish. Uh, so there is no restriction on implementing only one method from dynamic trait. Actually, you can even implement, just extend uh, the dynamic trait and not implement any of the methods as long as you don't need them. So as uh, when you don't refer to any member that is missing from the class definition. Hmm. Or uh, you can 
um, implement uh, multiple methods. So there is no problem in uh, implementing select dynamic and apply dynamic at the same time or implementing all of them. Uh, you can also try to uh, add extra parameters to the type signature as long as they're inferred by the compiler. So we can use type parameters and uh, using clauses or implicit clauses in Scala 2. Uh, we can also go further. So if you uh, saw the previous talk from Matt Bovell, uh, you should probably know what uh, singleton types are in Scala. So you can use them as part of your signature to um, restrict uh, whether something can be called uh, or not. So either even though you're using the dynamic trait, this might mm, cause compilation errors instead of runtime errors if you uh, specify mm, or restrict these uh, parameters in a proper way. And uh, you can also combine these syntactic rewrites with uh, other mm, features of Scala, including uh, metaprogramming, which might get very powerful when you combine these two. So just to give you an example, uh, I'm not going to dive into this code uh, too deeply, but this is to just to prove that what, what you can do when you combine uh, dynamics and uh, metaprogramming in Scala 3. So basically what happens here, we want to def define a class of a wrapper uh, on which you can like transparently uh, invoke uh, or re refer to its uh, members, like uh, the, uh, the members of uh, this inner object that we have here. So we implement the select dynamic method uh, with a macro, and it simply creates a, a um, AST with uh, the selection on this inner object and with the name that we provide. So uh, if you look at this example, we created a wrapper of option of one, and we try to uh, call is empty method on this wrapper. And because wrapper doesn't have this method, it gets proxied to underlying option. So after our rewrite, which gets inlined by the compiler, we get something like this. And in the first case, this is going to compile and return uh, true of type Boolean. And in the second case, we're going to get a compilation error. So even though we're using dynamics, we're fully safe here because everything happens at uh, compile time and no runtime error is going to occur uh, if we try to refer to a member which doesn't exist. OK, so and now we are trying to go um, structural more explicitly. Uh, so just to make uh, some things uh, clear, uh, types in uh, Scala can have refinements. Uh, you might uh, know that if you saw the previous talk or you just learned it from the documentation. And uh, a type which has some refinements is called a refined type. And refinements can be either structural on 
non-structural, let's say. So uh, structural refinement is a refinement that adds some member to a type uh, which was not present in this type before. On the contrary, this non-structural refinement just um, refers to a member which is known to be a part of this basic type, but we just make it more specific. Like in this example, uh, we narrow the return type of this method. And um, actually refinements can be carried uh, and we can swap their the order so these three types that you can see uh, are equivalent uh, and now we will learn about the selectable trait which is uh, similar to um, uh, dynamic somehow but it's also different uh, the what they have in common is that you also need to, to uh, extend selectable trait to activate this special behavior of the compiler which will also try to rewrite your code in some cases uh, but uh, this rewrite will be activated only if we try to refer to a member, the type member, which uh, got introduced via a structural refinement. So we add uh, something new to our type. Uh, and it's known at compile time that this member uh, should exist, even though it's not a part, a member of a class. And uh, we also get extra type safety because the compiler checks that all the type signature actually match with what we declared in this uh, refinement. Uh, selectable uh, trait is specific to Scala 3. It doesn't exist in Scala 2. And uh, it doesn't need to be enabled in any way. Mm. Uh, okay, so the mm, selectable has only two methods that, that we can uh, implement. It's select dynamic and apply dynamic. So as you can see, update dynamic and apply dynamic named are missing. Mm. The first one, select dynamic, uh, looks very similar to what it looks uh, in a dynamic trait. So assuming we have a class uh, representing a database row and in it extends selectable and it uh, implements our select dynamic method, if we now mm, create an instance of row but actually assure that it's not just a row, it's a row with some refinement. In our case, uh, a refinement with def foo of type int, uh, which we do by a cast, but normally that uh, should be done via metaprogramming or by some library. We don't want to uh, cast things uh, ourselves because it's error prone. Um, and uh, so if we have this instance of row of type row with foo, and we try to uh, select foo and bar from it, then in the first case, when uh, it gets rewritten to uh, select dynamic foo, because we know from the refinement that this member does exist yeah, and uh, uh, 
Additionally, the compiler provides a typecast to make sure this agrees with what we declared here. So if foo has type int, it needs to be cast uh, to int as well. Uh, but uh, because bar is not uh, a part of the type refinement, if it, even if it exists at runtime, uh, the compiler will complain. It will not compile, preventing us from a runtime error. Uh, and the second method, apply dynamic for selectables, also uh, also it's quite similar to what it looks uh, in dynamic trait in terms of uh, the possible type signatures but uh, now if we uh, define a type refinement for this uh, calc class, uh, we define the uh, root square, uh, square, square root uh, method, taking a double and returning a double, and we create an instance of our calculator, and we assure that it has the proper type with the refinement. Mm. And we try to call this uh, uh, root method on our calculator with some parameter. Uh, it gets uh, rewritten by the compiler to apply dynamic SQRT. Uh, we pass, or the compiler passes the, uh, the parameter for us, uh, assuring that it has the type as declared, and also the uh, return type uh, also is cast to what we expect it to be uh, from uh, the refinement. Um, okay, so now let's see how we can make a real use of what we've learned. Uh, while I was working on uh, selectables and dynamics, like I mm, came to an idea that bothered me for a long time, uh, and uh, I created a, a library called uh, Iskra, uh, which is a Scala 3 wrapper library uh, around Apache Spark uh, data frame API, which allows writing type safe and boilerplate free, but still efficient Spark code. Well, uh, not all of you might know what Spark is. Uh, so basically as they describe themselves, um, Apache Spark is a multi-language engine for executing data engineering, data science, and machine learning on single node machines uh, or clusters. So basically you use uh, Apache Spark uh, for making uh, big data computations. And uh, it's really a powerful tool, but it it also has some problems. Uh, basically, for Scala, it provides two flavors of API. Mm. Uh, we call them dataset API and data frame API. Basically, data sets and data frames represent, um, let's say, uh, mm, tables in a database, more or less, or some distributed collections. And uh, data frame API is based on case classes, while uh, for 
sorry, uh, data set uh, API is based on case classes and data frame uh, API uh, uses a much um, less strict structure. Uh, thanks to this, uh, the data set API uh, provides quite good type safety, although not everywhere. While data frame uh, API doesn't check almost anything at compile time, really. Uh, also, the data set API requires uh, quite a lot of boilerplate because if you use case classes and then you do some data transformations, then your data model changes. And for each intermediate step of your computations, you need a new case class for your data model and defining them is quite tedious. Uh, the data frame API avoids this problem uh, because you refer to uh, columns uh, by their string names. But this, uh, uh, as I said, this gives you very little type safety. It's easy to make a mistake. Uh, but the true reason why people use uh, data frame um, API is that it gets uh, better performance than the data set uh, API uh, because it avoids serializing and deserializing between uh, case classes that we use as our model. Uh, so let's see how, uh, like uh, what uh, a typical or a very simplified uh, uh, Spark Big Data Pipeline looks like when it's uh, expressed in Data Frame API. So we have a mm, data frame, which is called measurements. And we do some transformations on it, like we group on uh, the station ID column, because uh, these are data from weather stations. And then we try to aggregate it, like we take some minimal, maximal, average value from it. And then we give these new columns some names. And then we want to filter the results and then select just the columns that we are really interested in. But you might have spotted that actually we made a typo here. Uh, and as Spark API is a uh, Spark Data Frame API doesn't check uh, types and names of columns at compile time, you will learn about the error only at runtime. So uh, the purpose of ISCA is to be able to write this code in this way. So instead of referring to columns by their names as strings, we, we use normal member selections with a dot, uh, which, uh, so, uh, which might give us code completions, uh, which might fail compilation when we do a typo on or when the types are mismatched. And uh, how this works in general. So our um, this dollar sign, which uh, is inspired by the current Spark syntax, where you use a dollar interpolator to refer to a column with some name. Uh, this dollar represents the structure of a data row in a given context of our computations. So. If we move back, like in each of these uh, operations, like group by, aggregate, and where select, like the set of columns that are available and make sense are slightly different. So we just uh, refer to this dollar uh, to refer to particular columns. And uh, the type of dollar is actually a refined type, more or less what you can see in the right. 
so let's say view extend selectable. So if we have a view with a refinement uh, and each refinement uh, represents some column, then when we write dollar dot a, then this expression is going to be a column of int. And uh, we compute uh, these types uh, with macros and we propagate it via context functions. More or less, you can think of it like this. So select could take a lambda from our model to some new model, but uh, because we use context functions, uh, we would, about which you might learn more uh, tomorrow on during the talk uh, from Pablo Marx. Mm. Uh, because this is a context function, we could actually not write this thing and just have something like x select and then dollar a plus dollar b. And uh, because we know the type, the exact type of dollar a compile time and the type of dollar b, we also know the type of the resulting expression, uh, and we pass it over to our macros to compute the type of dollar for the next step of our computations. And internally, uh, it works like that uh, we, we use um, string literal types to track the names of columns uh, at compile time. So, uh, if you have this like data set of measurements, uh, you would know that each of its columns uh, had uh, not only is a column of some specific type, but it also has a name which is known at compile time. And that's everything for me. Thank you very much from, uh, for, for watching uh, this presentation. And uh, I'm here to answer your questions. Firing retro rock. Roger, Matt. Ready to eject.